Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday morning opportunity we have to again come together as a community of faith here online at Sunshine Salvos. I pray that this past week for you has been a good week, a productive week. I have a sense at the moment with things as they stand here in Victoria that we're kind of hovering, hovering around a number and, and hoping beyond hope that that number of daily cases of coronavirus continues to fall. But as it was said this morning on the news, uh, it's a stubborn virus and that we do have this sense at the moment that we are hovering, hovering around, around a dozen people uh, on a daily basis, new cases. And, and also lamenting the fact that people are still passing away as a result of this virus. And we are really hovering and hoping that the restrictions that we live under might be lifted, but also knowing in a responsible way that they really can't be lifted and shouldn't be until it is exactly the right time. So whilst we are in this state of hovering, I guess it's better than going backwards. And we're certainly in a lot better position now than what we were two months ago. So we continue to hope and pray and just hover at this time, but with hope and with prayer and with confidence that still better days are ahead. This morning, in our service, we're going to focus on the theme of the underdog. That's something that we understand quite well living out here in the western suburbs of Melbourne. That idea, that narrative of being the underdog. And there'll actually be an opportunity a little later in this service uh, for us to have a, a short interactive time where you'll have the opportunity to share perhaps an experience in your life where you really did feel that you were an underdog in a particular situation. Or at least if it wasn't you, then perhaps it was your sporting team or someone else you know who really was an underdog, but actually came through and won the day. That's a little later we'll have that time of sharing together. Let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon where we gathered here this morning. For me here, I am located on the sacred traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and also honor the aspirations of the future generations and future leaders within our First Nations community. And as an officer of the Salvation Army, I also recommit to the principles of reconciliation and justice in partnership with our First Nations people here in Australia. It's good to see a number of you joining us this morning. Good morning to family out at Murrubark. Great to see you here this morning and family as well in Box Hill. Good morning to you. Good morning, Norm and Ngu. Great to see you here this morning to Sean. Great to see you, welcome. I've just been told that I apparently my screen this morning is, must be one of those compressed screens. I've noticed uh, over this uh, lockdown period that um, not being able to get out and do the normal amounts of vigorous exercise, of course, that I would normally be engaged in, that uh, I may have uh, added a couple of kilos here and there. So. Uh, don't be alarmed. The screen might be a little thinner. Uh, it's doing me a favour at this time. Good morning, Anne and Ernst. Great to see you joining us from over there in Victor Harbour, South Australia. Good morning, Joy, and to other church family out at Melton at this time. Good morning, Sam and Christine. Good to see you. Good morning to Carla and perhaps Jenny 
might be there as well with you. Good morning to you. Great to see you here. Good morning, Delwyn. Always good to have you join us from down in Morwell, in Gippsland. Good morning, Joe, and good morning, Vicky. Good to see you here as well this morning. To Tao and Tan, good morning to you. Great to have you, Margaret, Kelly. Lovely to see you here this morning as well. And to Margaret Dyer and Marcia, good to see you. Good morning to other family who've joined us from Coburg as well. Good to see you and others will join us as we proceed forwards with our service this morning. I have a prayer that I want to begin with this morning. And it's a prayer that I think is a valuable prayer at this time. So I bring it to you and it's a prayer that's entitled at the heart of turbulence. And it may well be that at certainly at this time that you have felt that your life is going through a state of turbulence, that things around you are a bit shaky. This is a prayer, especially for you this morning, and a prayer that really does open up our worship and commence our time together. Let us pray. God of peace, let us, your people, know that at the heart of turbulence, there is an inner calm that comes from faith in you. Keep us from being content, though, with things as they are, that from this central peace we have that there may come a creative compassion, a thirst for justice, and a willingness to give of ourselves in the spirit of Christ. Bless us this morning as we worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you here as well, Kim. There with Sean over in Box Hill. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good to see you, Alison and Ian. Welcome to you. Good morning to our friends at Tyler Street, Anthony there with a new worker as well, Lee, but certainly always very, very happy to know that you're there, Carmen and Tony and Luke. Great to see you all. And uh, we really hope that you enjoy this time we're going to share together this morning. So here's an extra wave for you, Carmen and Tony and Luke this morning. Great to have you here with us from Tyler Street. Good morning, Stephen and Meg from out in Melton as well. We're going to sing a couple of songs this morning to commence our worship. The first song we uh, had the opportunity to sing this morning is Jehovah Jireh, which is a Hebrew term. It's a name of God, God being Jehovah. Jireh mean, meaning God who gives and provides. So our God is our Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and his grace is sufficient for our needs. So we'll sing that through this morning and then I will also sing that lovely prayer chorus, Spirit of the Living God, all afresh on me. Jehovah Jireh my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. The Lord will provide all my needs according to his riches in glory. He will send his angels to watch over me. Jehovah Jireh takes care of me, of me, of me. Jehovah Jireh takes care of me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. 
provider, His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. The Lord will provide all my needs according to His riches in glory. He will send His angels to watch over me. Jehovah Jireh takes care of me, of me, of me. Jehovah Jireh takes care of me. The Lord will provide all my needs according to His riches in glory. He will send His angels to watch over me. Jehovah Jireh takes care of me, of me. Of me, Jehovah Jireh takes care of me. Of me, of me, Jehovah Jireh takes care of me. pray this morning that your spirit would again fall afresh within us. Lord, we ask that you give us a real sense of your presence with us at this time, wherever we're gathered, that we would be reminded that you are our provider, that you provide everything we need day by day, enough to cover our needs. You are the great and graceful provider. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, I want to pray, especially at this time, that you would be the provider of comfort and peace, especially for Vicky and her family at this time. We pray that you would be with them as they continue to mourn the loss of Joan, Vicky's mum. But particularly, Lord, be with Vicky and her family tomorrow as they say their final farewells to Joan. Lord, be with them. Surround them with your love and your comfort. Be Jehovah Jireh for Vicky and her family tomorrow. Lord, wipe away their tears and surround them with your love, your peace and your comfort at this time. Lord, bless Vicky and her family, especially tomorrow also pray for others who we've prayed for in recent weeks, Lord, without naming them all, I lift them up to you in prayer. 
Lord, bless them. Continue to be in their healing. Continue to be with them at this time. Lord, we thank you because above all things, you are still God, that you do still hold everything of reality within your creative hands and that your love for us remains constant and steadfast and that we remain in the centre, in the palms of your hands. Lord, we thank you for all of who you are and we worship you here this morning. We pray these things in, in the name of Jesus who taught his followers to pray the Lord's Prayer as we pray it together this morning as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> Good morning, Kevin and Hillary. Good to see you here this morning, joining us from Melton. Great to see you. And thank you for being a part of our worship this morning. To my auntie Ethel and uncle Graham as well over in Box Hill, good to see you as well. And other family in Murrubuck, great to see you here this morning. Last night, some of the gentlemen of Sunshine Salvos, we came together online and just shared together how we're journeying at the moment, recognising, of course, that yesterday was World Mental Health Day and that it is always a good thing, a positive thing, when men can come together and just talk about how they're travelling. And so we did that last night and that was a great time for those gentlemen who came along and were a part of that. Now, of course, as far as announcements go, uh, it would be remiss of me uh, not to mention that this coming Saturday evening, that it's the ladies' turn to be able to gather together online. So there will be a Shine Online service with Lieutenant Fung, and she will have some fun activities and also opportunity for ladies to share with each other just how they're going at this time as well. So that will be this Saturday, the 17th, of October at 7 p.m. Uh, meeting, of course, within the Sunshine Salvos Facebook page where a link will come up for you to join uh, Fung's room and uh, to enjoy that time with other ladies together. Next week, uh, we'll be blessed by uh, the Sunday service at 10 a.m. here in this uh, regular time slot, uh, uh, Cadet Sean will be leading that service. So I encourage you to come along and support him next Sunday morning in our worship time together. That's all the announcements I have for this time. Uh, also to mention, of course, as I alluded to in the prayer that I prayed that tomorrow Joan Trevers will be uh, farewelled. Um, there will be a service happening at Sunshine Salvos at our hall at 11.30. Obviously, we, we appreciate at this time that with restrictions as they are, that that only allows for 10 people to attend that service. However, I believe there will be a Zoom um, coverage of the service as well. I think what would be probably easiest if you wanted to join that would be to maybe make contact with Vicky and she can arrange for a, a, an invitation uh, to be sent to you to be able to access a live streaming of that service tomorrow morning at 11.30, uh, remembering and celebrating the life of Joan Trevers. That's all the announcements 
I have for now. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service, there, there is now an opportunity for us to share together a time in your life where you or someone you knew were in a situation where you really did feel like, or perhaps just plainly were, the underdog. And while you're thinking of one of those times and would be willing to just type it into the comments section uh, of our stream so that we can uh, share that this morning, I will also say a good morning to Sylvie. Good to see you. Uh, to Mark up at Bendigo, great to see you here this morning, joining us from that wonderful regional centre of Victoria in Bendigo. And others as well who I know will be joining us in due course. A time when you were an underdog. I'm trying to think of a time for me that I felt like I was an underdog. I, I'd probably reflect back on most of the maths tests and exams that I had to endure as a student. Uh, they were definitely times where I felt like I was the underdog. In fact, I probably felt even less than an underdog. I think I felt like I was out in the doghouse uh, trying to do things that uh, my mind was just clearly not capable of achieving. Uh, every maths experience for me was an underdog experience. I also felt on occasions when I was in Vietnam like an underdog like I was uh, struggling to uh, be on an equal footing with others over there because of not understanding language and, and culture at times. And, and uh, they, they were times as well, traveling, where I felt like I was an underdog. Feel free to uh, put in the comments, maybe an, a time and opportunity a, a, a circumstance in your life where you felt as though you really were taking up the status of being an underdog and we'll reflect on those as you share with us your comment your experience of being the underdog And I'm trusting and believing that because there is a, a delay between the words that come from my mouth and how the, and the time in which they're received by you through this stream, that that explains why there aren't any comments yet. But it also could mean, of course, that none of you have been underdogs because you've all been champions in your life and everything you do. But my sense is probably that there have been times where you have felt that you really were the underdog. In fact, Sean has just uh, shared with us that he felt like he was an underdog playing football for the West and having a game on the MCG when he played in a team and playing a, a particular team from the Eastern suburbs. I think um, many of us who have grown up living in the Western suburbs of Melbourne and even those adopted sons of the West, like myself, often uh, connect with and understand that feeling of being the underdog, that we're up against it, that there are other people around us who seem to have it easier and seem to uh, get things easier in life, that we have to work a bit harder over this side of Melbourne for things. So thank you for sharing that, Sean. Significantly, you didn't mention in there whether or not you won the game or not, but in some ways that doesn't matter because it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play. That's what they always say. Any other comments, reflections that people would make about being the underdog in life? Perhaps you might have been the youngest in your family. That's something I can also relate to. 
though I have to say in that respect, I never felt like I was the underdog. Um, Alison has commented here that she feels like the underdog with relation to the decisions that uh, get made by her superiors, the, her authorities regarding her employment. And in those instances where really Alison doesn't have much of a say, uh, I think in our working life, at times we can feel like we're up against it, that we are the underdog, that there are powers at play that do act arbit arbitrarily uh, and that often has an effect on us and we feel powerless. So thank you for sharing that, Alison. I think that that experience is uh, common to a lot of people in their workplaces of feeling disempowered and truly an underdog in those circumstances. Uh, Mark Wagland has commented here that he married a lady from over in the eastern suburbs and, and that she is always, as a, as a matter of rule, uh, reminded Mark of the difference between those over in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and the, those of the west. Thank you, Mark, for sharing that. I, I, as many of you know, I grew up over in the eastern suburbs for the absolute majority of my uh, younger years and, and, and younger adult life, only having spent the last 20 years over in the western suburbs of Melbourne. There is a difference between the East and the West, but that in no way infers at all that the Eastern suburbs are better. In fact, being an adopted son of the West, I think I would probably go the other way now, but I'm not wanting to cause any controversies or class wars or suburb wars here this morning. We'll leave it there. I think that you can, without having to put your fingers to the keyboard, which of course is your choice, but I think we can all reflect and think of times in our lives where we really have felt like we were looking at something that was bigger than ourselves, that we were in a fight perhaps, or we were in a situation where we felt that we were comparatively small compared with that which we were up against. I know they, in sporting contests, they speak about teams being the underdog quite frequently. And even as recently, perhaps as last week, when we saw Collingwood head over to Perth as the underdog, but pull off a, a wonderful, courageous win against all the odds. That really was an underdog victory. It didn't stand up for them so well last night, but we are constantly reminded in life, especially as a sporting country with sports uh, so strongly within our, our culture here in Australia that, that we un understand clearly in a sporting sense, those teams which are the underdog, but in life generally. I think we all can relate to those times in our life where we have felt like that. Jo has made the comment here that uh, when she was playing basketball for the state of Victoria, wow, Jo, this is revelatory. Didn't know about your basketball prowess. Uh, when Jo played basketball for the state of Victoria railway team and other states had better players, I always felt like an underdog in relation in relation to uh, the number of points that she could get in the basket. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. Uh, Joy in Melton has also made the comment here. I was the only girl in a family of three brothers. I wasn't the underdog. They were. <laughs> they always said that I was my parents' favourite. Yeah, sometimes the tables turn, don't they? that uh, the, the one that we would think would be the underdog actually isn't. And 
actually in some ways that speaks into our message today, which I'm just about to get to. As we look at a familiar story, it's a story that I've reflected on before at Sunshine Salvos a few years ago now. Hopefully enough years have passed that this might uh, be a little fresh again to you. But um, I wanted to reflect on, on the very famous story of, I guess, the Bible's most celebrated underdog and, and, and really the, the underdog victory that is held up and, and, and is a part of not only church life, but just how our culture. The story of David, of course, coming up against the giant Goliath. It flows on very well from the message last week. Last week, we had a, a group of Israelites who said that they went into the land of Canaan and saw giants and felt so small in comparison that they looked like grasshoppers compared with all those giants. And today we look at another giant and his encounter with a little guy named David. But there might be a little twist to this story. So I read this morning from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 41 to 50. And you might have noted within this stream, I've also put a link to a YouTube uh, clip, which I'd encourage you to watch at some point, which just reminds us again of the story of David and Goliath from a, from a historical viewpoint. But 1 Samuel 17, verse 41 to 50, we read that Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David that you come at me with a stick and that you come at me in that way. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I will give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals, Goliath roared. David shouted in reply, you come to me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and I will cut off your head. And I will give you and the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God. In Israel. And everyone will know that the Lord does not need weapons to rescue his people. It is his battle. Not ours. The Lord will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it from his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face downward to the ground. And so David triumphed over the Philistine giant with only a stone and a sling. May God add wisdom to the reading of his word this morning. We all know this story. If there's a story in the Bible that really we could ask any person, at least even if they hadn't ever stepped foot in a church to tell us what's a Bible story you know, or something from the Bible, then they might at least be able to say, well, well there was the story of David killing Goliath. It's such a well-known narrative that's transcended the church into our culture over millennia because it really is, as the church has understood it, interpreted it and spoken of it for, for since time immemorial, it's been the ultimate underdog story. It gives rise to this idea and 
and and cliches and things like it's not the size of the dog in the fight but it's the size of the fight in the dog it gives rise to that very sense of um rising up as a person who has little hope of victory but overcoming the odds and achieving victory as an underdog that's the story of david and goliath and how it's usually been understood and i think in our own way especially at this time we we probably have ourselves felt like the underdog having to uh remain under the restrictions and and subject to all of the precautions and things going on as we've lived through this year 2020 the year of the pandemic and what that has meant for us that even at times we've felt like uh we are an underdog with this virus that is so contagious and so rampant when it gets a hold of a community and so this story i think will speak to us but i do want to reflect upon this story again and see it through a different lens because i think whilst the underdog narrative in its own way has a level of romance and attraction to it can also be a little disempowering and it also can hold us back i think from achieving the fullness of what we're actually capable of as people and especially as children of god and the way that that relates to this story is is pretty clear you see we've always had this understanding and it's always been the the translation into english from the original text that has taken this story and said as i read at the end that god triumphed through david defeating this giant with only only a stone and a sling but there's always been this idea that david really was the ultimate underdog that he really was extremely vulnerable extremely at risk and most likely was going to get killed out on that battlefield that day against this giant this imposing figure in all of his heavy armor and all of his weaponry and his acclaim and all of his trash talking and all of who goliath was was physically imposing upon this little ruddy faced weedy shepherd boy david son of jesse but there's a twist to this story and i share it with you again because it gives us cause to think about the question of who actually really was the underdog this battle between David and Goliath took place in a valley. Up on one side of the embankment were the armies of the Philistines. And on the other side were the armies and the men of Israel. And down in this embankment, there was David and Goliath face to face with some distance between them. Now we know before, this reading that I gave this morning, we know that David was offered armor to wear. In fact, they put it on him and, and it was uh, too big for him and it weighed him down. And even David said, look, this is ridiculous. If I go out and wear this, I'll have no chance. And he wouldn't have. If David had have walked out on that battlefield with the same armor, with the same uh, weapons as Goliath had, then truly he wouldn't have been an underdog. He would have been ripe for the slaughter and David rejects that he says no I will go out as I am and he does that can I tell you the moment that David set foot in that little valley between the armies on each side the minute he set foot within that valley and picked up those stones and put them in his sling to face that giant the moment he walked out into that scenario it wasn't David who was the underdog, it was Goliath. Because effectively what had happened in that moment was that Goliath, in effect, had brought his knives to 
a gunfight. You see, what we have to understand from this story is that David as a shepherd boy was skilled with using a sling. He had used that proficiently. The text tells us that he had killed lions, bears, other wild animals in and around the shepherd locale where he lived, protecting his sheep. He was skilled, highly skilled, using a stone and a sling. And a stone and a sling isn't some cheap second-rate form of weaponry. It is a deadly weapon. And David walking out onto that battlefield, armed with that sling and stones, was effectively the same as him walking out with a rifle and pointing that rifle at the head of someone who was unarmed with a similar kind of weaponry to have any chance of combating. So David walks out with all of his experience, with all of his knowledge, with all of the lightness and the freedom of who he is. And he steps onto that battlefield and fights someone who is completely ill-equipped to deal with the threat that he faced. Now, we have this sense from the text that Goliath didn't fully understand or appreciate the absolute peril he was in. He mocked David, looked at him and, and said that you're nothing. You come at me with sticks and stones. Look at me in my armour, in my grandeur, in all of my violent, imposing threat. And yet, really, Goliath should have been the one shaking in fear because David held in his hand the very thing that would bring Goliath undone. And if Goliath, Goliath didn't know it then, well, he would soon know it because that single stone slung out of David's sling with such a velocity, a stone, maybe not a whole lot bigger than this, being slung out of a sling comes with such a velocity it is literally, literally like a bullet being fired out of a gun straight into Goliath's head, a headshot. And of course, Goliath went down and David finished him off. So who was the underdog? Who really was the underdog? I dare to suggest that actually it was Goliath who was the underdog. It was Goliath who had the very, very small chance of defeating David. And it was because David went into the battle on his terms with all of the things that he was equipped with, with all of his experience, with all of the, the tools and the things that were familiar to him in his hand. But most importantly, of, of course, David went into that battle with the strength of the Lord with him. And it was God who won that victory on that day. But let it be said that the role that David played in that victory was significant because he used everything of what he knew of himself to achieve that victory. Now, what does that say to us? As I said, I think when we have lived or grown up over here in the Western suburbs, we have often felt as though we were the underdogs living here in Melbourne, that there has been a, a distinction drawn between the haves and the have nots those who do it tougher than those who perhaps do it a little easier over the other side of Melbourne. As I said previously, I think when we think about the narrative of the underdog, there is a certain charm about it. There is a certain allure and romanticism about being the underdog, but it's also limiting. And I say that because if we claim and hold on to too much, this idea that we're the underdog, that we're constantly fighting and we're constantly up against it. I think what it does effectively, is it, it brings almost a little of a defeatist attitude. And it also gives us an out 
that in the battles and the things we face in life, that if they don't go our way, well, then we can always fall back on this, uh, this almost comfortable idea that, well, what, what did I expect? How was I ever going to achieve any kind of victory here? I'm the underdog. There's almost a, a concessionary tone with focusing and living out too heavily that, that ethos, that idea that we're constantly the underdog. It provides an out for us. In fact, some would say it even can provide an excuse for the way and the things that happen in our life. I want to suggest to you this morning that one of the most dominant narratives within our faith tradition, this narrative of David taking down a giant, Goliath, actually provides us with a wonderful encouragement that says to us, even when we might think we're the underdog, even when the world might think we're the underdog, actually, perhaps we're not. Perhaps we actually should give ourselves a little more credit for who we are, for the skills we possess, for the resilience we have that life has developed in us, because we can fight and we can win in our own way. So I want to encourage you with that message this morning, especially at this time when we really are feeling a little flat, hovering at the moment, waiting for things to lift, waiting for there to become to become some kind of changed reality for us, you know, to be able to go back and do some shopping, to be able to go back and visit our families, to be able to visit friends and go back for, for some of us to work. We're, we're hovering and waiting for that. But I really want to encourage you to be confident in who you are because you can do this. We can do this together. We don't have to see ourselves as always the downtrodden as the underdogs in this situation. We can have the victory in our life. And importantly, we've got to keep our hope and our faith in the God who is a God of victory. For he's with us. We know the, the verse from the New Testament that reflects that wonderful truth. If God is with us, then who can be against us? We need to be confident, we need to be bold, and we need to think more highly, I suggest, of ourselves and our ability to be able to move through this time in our lives into a better tomorrow. So I wanted to leave that message with you today because you might be feeling like you're the underdog in this situation, even in the fight against this COVID-19 virus. I might suggest to you that with God on our side, that perhaps your underdog status may not exactly be as justified as what you think it might be. Perhaps you have within you the very resources, wisdom, common sense, resilience, and fighting ability in who you are on your terms to be able to win the battle at the moment. And that battle might be simply the battle of getting your kids back to school tomorrow. It might be the battle of keeping yourself occupied, keeping yourself sane at this time. It might be the battle that you've got in your backyard that's gone crazily overgrown like mine has, that I have to get back out there and sort it out. It might be the battle of simply getting through this coronavirus period with your sanity intact. Can I encourage you, don't fall back on the underdog, defeatist narrative too much, but move forwards boldly with confidence, knowing that you can do this, that you have within your power and abilities every, every right and every chance and opportunity to prove yourself. And most importantly, know that you go in the strength of the Lord and that he is with you all the way. We might think of David as the underdog. I think we ought to think again, because what his story actually does tell us and encourage us 
something quite different perhaps than we've always reflected on. May you be just like David, bold, a killer, confident, and ready to win with everything that you have in your hand, which God has given you. Be confident, be bold, be victorious at this time. Let's pray. Thank you, God, because you have given us our life experiences and many of the things that we hold in our hands and in our lives that do equip us to be able to face the things of today and tomorrow. But most of all, we thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us to do that ourselves, but that you are with us and that you fight for us. Lord, we pray that we would continue to offer ourselves to you, trusting in you, hoping in you, placing our faith in your goodness and in your absolute ability to win the day. Lord, help us to keep that faith, and keep that hope alive inside. In the days ahead, Lord, we pray that we would have a real sense that better days are ahead of us, that your victory is at hand, and that we are moving forwards and not backwards. Lord, give us a sense of that. Help us, Lord, in the days ahead to remain steadfast and bold, confident and strong in our faith in you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before Lieutenant Fung brings the benediction blessing to us this morning, there were a few more stories that people have. Uh, written uh, examples where they felt like they were the underdog in life. I'm, I'm not going to read those now because we're about to conclude the service, but I encourage you to read them. I'm especially read, interested to read that one from my brother, which I will uh, certainly have a look at when this service is finished. A benediction, prayer and blessing. Thank you. A prayer of benediction today. May the love of God, the Father, and amazing grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you. This week, bless you and help you to move forward with confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great to see you again. Thank you for joining us today. Continue to live boldly, strongly, but keep safe as well. And we'll see you again next week as Cadet Sean brings to us the service here at Sunshine Salvos Online. God bless you this week. Bye for now. Bye.